Coming up on Market to Market. Keeping ethanol on the payroll and on the road. And a bug puts the squeeze on the citrus fruit harvest. Those stories and market analysis with John Roach, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, February 3 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The prospect of a stronger economy gave Americans enough hope to dip their toe into the job market. Labor Department data reveals unemployment rose one-tenth of one percent in January as more people searched for work. However, consumer confidence fell back from last month's 15-year high on worries over finding a job. The Creighton University Nine-State Business Conditions Index hit its highest level in 12 months as economic optimism held the, static of the statistic above growth neutral. And the general condition of the economy was enough for the Fed to leave interest rates alone. Trump policy has jolted the U.S. economy. Rural America launched the 45th president into office as the candidate promised better deals and partnerships. Ethanol has long been a boon to corn producers, even as previous administrations helped tear down the blend wall while deflating the renewable fuel standard. And as Josh Bittner discovered, the prospect of a continuation of the status quo may have delivered the election. At the end of the day, Trump is a businessman. He understands the importance of trade. He knows what our industry and what farmers need in terms of export opportunities. And he's negotiating right now. National and homegrown figures gathered for the 11th annual Iowa Renewable Fuels Summit this week to discuss the future of grain, ethanol, and biofuel markets. The RFS, which is Renewable Fuel Standard, is an important tool in the mission to achieve energy independence for the United States. I will do all that is in my power as president to achieve that goal. Last year, then-candidate Trump pledged to uphold the RFS, which mandates a 10% ethanol blend in the gasoline supply of several states. Having a president in place that will fight for us is going to be refreshing. Keynote speaker Bob Deneen of the Washington, D.C.-based Renewable Fuels Association highlighted the Corn Belt's connection to the sea change in the nation's capital. Citing USDA statistics, he pointed out 133 of the 218 counties that flipped from Obama in 2012 to Trump in 2016 produced at least 1 million bushels of corn in 2015, valued at over $7 billion. And in the case of ethanol, 33 plants located in 29 swing counties produced nearly $5 billion worth of the predominantly corn-based fuel additive. In the broader context, Deneen said 95% of the counties housing the nation's 205 ethanol plants with a minimum 8 million gallon capacity favored Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton. What we haven't had is an administration that will fight for us so that when, for example, the European Union imposes an illegal anti-dumping duty, you know, it would have been great for the U.S. government to have taken an action at the WTO. But Ethanol advocates say President Obama did few favors for an industry that exported 836 million gallons of ethanol in 2015. Still, with fossil fuel ties in Trump's cabinet and persistent low grain prices on the heels of a bin-busting harvest, a kernel of apprehension remains. When you're a renewable fuels producer, what are you trying to do? At the bottom line, you're trying to take market share away from the world's most rich and powerful industry called petroleum. And that's why we're focused on higher blends. Proponents in Iowa see a strong future for higher octane fuels with less cost to consumers and lower environmental impact. 
especially in places like China, where cities have been plagued by thick smog in recent years. In 2015, the Middle Kingdom accounted for 50% of American dried distillers grain exports, an ethanol byproduct used to feed livestock. However, the Asian nation slapped a 30% tariff on those goods last year, and the market all but evaporated. Fortunately, the ethanol industry sees a secret weapon in Iowa Governor Terry Branstad, Trump's nominee for ambassador to China. The longest serving governor in U.S. history has been a longtime advocate for Corn Belt exports and has strong ties with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. I've tried to explain to the Chinese that he's going to be a new leader for this country and he's a strong leader and, and uh, China's got a strong leader and I know them both very well and hopefully we can find a way that uh, we can do what's good for America but it can also be a win-win situation that's beneficial for China. Industry backers continue to relay Trump's assurances the RFS will remain intact, but admit farmers and ethanol producers may need to hold him accountable for campaign promises. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. The war against invasive species never ends, and it is often fought with weapons that only slow expansion. For citrus growers, it's combat against a devastating pest no larger than a grain of rice. Colleen Bradford Krantz has our cover story. University of Florida entomologist Michael Rogers remembers the text message in 2005 that told him citrus greening had been detected in Florida, the first time the devastating plant disease, also known as Huang Long Bing or HLB, had been found in the United States. That was a, a day that people probably remember very well because we've all known that was the, the worst disease worldwide of citrus. I remember sitting in a, in a meeting and getting a text said, hey, you know, it's here, HLB. I was like, really? Because we knew it was gonna change how we did things. And it did. In the intervening years, citrus greening has slashed productivity in all of Florida's primary citrus regions. And it's not just oranges that are affected. Grapefruit, tangerine, and other citrus trees are also damaged and ultimately killed by the bacterial disease, which is spread via the Asian citrus psyllid, a non-native insect measuring just four millimeters. The bacterium attacks the plant's vascular system, preventing the fruit from ripening and eventually killing the tree. When we first got greening back in 2005, about 2006, uh, I think a lot of us were in a little bit of denial about being able to manage the pest and the disease. Um, and, and things got pretty serious pretty fast. It's been, it's been pretty devastating. As diseased groves have been abandoned or torn up, the land dedicated to citrus production has declined 40% over the last decade, dropping to 435,300 acres as of 2016. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says the current orange harvest projected to yield 71 million 90-pound boxes would be the smallest in the state in 66 years. In the decade before the arrival of citrus greening, Florida orange growers typically produced more than 200 million boxes of the fruit annually. The estimated value of all Florida citrus production has dropped 40% from $1.8 billion in 2008 to $1.1 billion in 2016. And as citrus acres disappeared, the number of jobs supported by the state's $10 billion citrus industry shrank. A study by the University of Florida estimated the state lost 18% of citrus-related jobs between 2007 and 2013. In many cases, there aren't as many of those folks out there anymore because there's just not enough fruit to support those jobs. And so um, it can be very, very devastating to, to communities, especially in, in uh, the growing regions of Florida, that depend on agriculture as a, an economic driving force for, for revenue. Arcadia, Florida, a town of 7,600, is in the state's second most productive citrus county, DeSoto, and has suffered from the spread of citrus greening. Mayor Judy Wirtz Strickland finds it difficult to watch the decline of an industry so central to the area's identity. With fewer workers, they spend less money in the stores downtown, especially the grocery stores. 
citrus has been a part of this community um, since ever since I can remember and I would hate to see it go away. Many producers with smaller operations have had to give up, including some who were third or fourth generation orange or grapefruit growers. Chris Strickland of Alturas, Florida, had to knock down the orange grove he bought in 2015 from a neighbor. Strickland knew the 80-acre grove was infected, but had hoped to harvest parts of it for a few more years. It was heart-wrenching to, to push this grove. But I also understood that the grove owners around me that have spent just tremendous amounts of money to save their groves were not being benefited by a dead grove that was actually harboring a disease that needed to be, it needed to be gone. Strickland plans to replant the grove, knowing the trees will eventually become infected. However, he's hoping someone finds an answer sooner rather than later. The federal government has designated quarantine areas to help prevent the spread of both the Asian citrus psyllid and the disease itself. And where the disease has already progressed, it is providing money to help growers replant after they tear out a diseased grove. According to Florida citrus producers, growers have directed $27 million from a citrus box tax over the past decade to search for ways to combat citrus greening. During the past eight years, USDA has invested more than $400 million in a search for answers, much in the form of grants to scientists. But despite the efforts of more than 100 researchers, a cure has yet to be found. There is some work that's ongoing looking at ways to maybe not reverse, but try to stabilize trees and keep them healthy and uh, as healthy and productive as possible despite the fact that they're infected with the pathogen. Those strategies include one approach where the trees are steamed to temporarily kill the bacteria. Growers have also attempted to synchronize pesticide application to prevent the insect from just moving to the grove next door. Some citrus industry officials are optimistic that several varieties of mandarin orange trees show greater tolerance, though not resistance, to the disease. Florida growers, who have largely focused on oranges used to make orange juice, are hoping for a similar find in a juice variety. Citrus greening has now been detected in all other major U.S. citrus-producing states. So far, the disease has been less widespread outside of Florida. Other countries and states are watching Florida, hoping for an answer. We haven't found the happy ending yet, um, but we're working as hard as we can to get there. We've got the firepower to continue the fight, and uh, I think that we will eventually win. Uh, it's just how long folks will stick with us and how long folks can stick it out in these groves. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Kranz. Next, the Market to Market Report. At the beginning of the week, the Catalan feed report pulled markets lower. However, fund buying gave the trade a bump by the final session. For the week, March wheat gained a dime, and the nearby corn contract moved sideways. Despite market bulls pushing back, the March soybean contract fell 23 cents. March meal dropped 11.40 per ton. In the softs, March cotton added $1.56 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, February Class Three milk futures gained 21 cents. The livestock sector was mixed as the April cattle contract fell $1.71, March feeders shed 3.88 and the April lean hog contract improved $1.95. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index lost 69 basis points. Crude oil put on 66 cents per barrel. Gold gained 29.70 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index rose nearly three points to finish the week at 400 even. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is our senior market analyst, John Roach. John, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here. We're glad to have you. But before we get started, you can listen to our market uh, our discussion anytime by downloading our market analysis podcast on our website, iptv.org slash mtom. All right, John, let's jump in. Let's, let's start with this wheat market. Are the bears finally in hibernation as we look at Chicago wheat? Perhaps. I mean, perhaps. Uh, the market had a, a run-up uh, that peaked a couple weeks ago and then turned around and fell 
hard uh, and uh, actually came down into buy signals this week. Okay. And, um, and so we may, we may have taken away that pressure for a little while. But the, the, the problem with wheat is when you pull up the fundamentals that you see ending stocks in the world and ending stocks in the United States, and they're both at, at record or near record levels. And so the, 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 the problem is we just have big supplies. Uh, now, we do have a, a smaller acreage planted in the United States. We're worried a little bit about the acreage getting planted in spring wheat country because there's a lot of snow cover there. And so there are some things that can come along, uh, but at least at the moment, uh, we still have a market that's heavily dominated by the specs on the short side, and we have uh, uh, fundamentals that, uh, that appear uh, burdensome. Uh, and are likely to keep the market stuck in a narrow trading range. Now, in this narrow trading range, you know, we've talked a lot on this program about how this is this is not a profitable price level for a lot of uh, winter wheat producers. Is that true globally? Are we going to see a reduction in global wheat acres down here in the in the four to four and a quarter price range? It's possible. Um, the uh, uh, we saw, as I said, we saw that in the United States in our winter wheat plantings. But if you look at wheat, it's raised around the world in a lot of different countries where there's really not a lot of alternative crops for them to produce. And so it's hard to get acreage to, to come down. And remember, it's a food crop. And so a lot depends on, uh, uh, on what kind of yields they have and if they have exportable surpluses or not, uh, or if they need to be uh, major importers. Uh, and... Uh, uh, you know, our yields last year in this country, even though our acres were down, they were monster yields. And so it's, uh, uh, we, need, we need to have that change in order to change the psychology on wheat. Okay. But we came up out of your buy signal on, on uh, winter wheat this week, and we're quite a ways, I'm guessing, below a sell signal as you look at uh, we're, the market. Yeah, in statistics. fact, as we just came off of one a couple of weeks ago, uh, the one that we're most interested in is Minneapolis wheat. We think if, if there's going to be a wheat market that rallies, it's going to be the higher quality Minneapolis wheat uh, because of the, of the quality shortages around the world, in addition to that, the weather concerns for the spring. Okay. Well, now let's talk about the corn crop. We've got producers who have been watching this range-bound corn trade for weeks on end, wondering if we're going to get the old crop corn market to bounce up and out of it. Can we break through, you know, 370 at some point and make some sales up there? Or do you just target 365 and let it go? Well, just expect the market to stay in a broad sideways pattern until something changes. I mean, we've got big inventories of, of corn in this country. We've got big inventories of coarse grains throughout the world. Uh, and so we, we have to eat our way through those inventories. The market moves up uh, uh, and it runs into farmer selling, which stops it. It falls back down and runs into user buying, which supports it. So back and forth, back and forth, supplying the, the needs of, the, uh, of both groups of people, the producers who need to generate cash flow and the users who need to accumulate inventory. What we think is, is important for the user right now is to pay attention to the time of the year. This is February. This is the time of year when markets tend to make some sort of a low relative to what's going to happen out in the spring and summer. So we think feed users should be paying close attention here. Look for buy signals and corn to accumulate the needs, your feed needs through the summer months. You want to get things bought now when the market appears to be oversupplied rather than have to chase the market during some sort of a weather concern that normally comes around in the spring to summer of the year. You bet. So then the flip side would be for producers looking at making some of those sales. Wait for the, the sell signal, which you anticipate to come on a weather scare later, even in old crop? Well, we've had sell signals really here. We had one a couple of weeks ago. So, so the market's cycling back and forth in a, in a really predictable, somewhat predictable pattern. At least it's been predictable. Right. I'm not sure it will be in the future, but it's been predictable. So back and forth, back and forth, peaking every 30 to 45 days. Each of the peaks have been just a smidgen higher than before, but not really any upward movement. Okay. We think there's good support down underneath the market. Market. We think there's solid levels of demand underneath the market. So we, we're, we think we can have some better opportunities. But it's February. It's not when you're supposed to be a seller of corn. Right. This is when you're a buyer of corn, not a seller. We're sellers of corn in March, April, May, and June, particularly in the month of April. So those months are still out ahead of us. All right. So on the new crop side, we're still holding back, waiting for those weather scares to prompt a sell signal a little bit later on this, uh, this spring. Exactly. We th it's the wrong time of year. The specs are on the wrong uh, side of the market, and we're below, uh, we're, not, we're not at the upper edge of USDA price uh, forecast. So our four key market indicators are telling us at the moment, don't be selling any corn right now. Look for a place to own what you need for feed. 
Okay, now let's talk about soybeans. We've seen a lot of volatility in that old crop contract, and we've got a question here from one of our followers on Twitter. We encourage all of you to tweet at us or find us on Facebook. You can just search for Market to Market. This one is from Will in Jasper County, Iowa at Will Cannon 64. He's asking, with Brazil's crop nearing harvest, is there increasing risk of old crop soybean prices falling while new crop maintains current levels on North American weather risk? Okay, excellent question. Uh, however, uh, if old crop beans come under pressure, trust me, new crop beans will as well. And so uh, I think that there's risk on soybeans in general as we move into the bulk of the harvest. We're about 20% harvested in the biggest state in Mato Grosso in, in uh, Brazil. Uh, and uh, the yields in general are pretty good. Uh, and uh, so it would seem to me that, 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 that we'll have increased harvest pressure as time goes along. But remember, they started out, uh, this is the end of their drought year that they had in, in, uh, in Brazil and the flooding year that they had in Argentina a year ago. Uh, so their pipelines are very bare. They've really not been able to supply much export quantity really for the last couple of months. So uh, we think that, that it's going to take a little bit of time to get their pipelines filled up before the exportable supplies become available. And, and we think that's what happened this week. When the market got sold off on a technical sell-off, it ran right into a buzzsaw of buying demand, which brought beans right back up again until that was satisfied, and then the technicals took it back down again today. So. Uh, you know, there is solid support underneath of the market. We are going to run into competition. And so I think that it's important to, on rallies and beans, you've got to get yourself comfortable because the, the South American weather risk period is ending. And you've got to then look forward to North America. And we don't have much risk in North America for the next couple months. Yeah. So it's going to be a difficult time, we're afraid, for beans as those harvest, uh, the combines roll in uh, South America. So as we look out and we've got, uh, you know, a couple months here before planters start to roll in this country while harvest is going on in South America. How much, how much, what percentage of new crop beans would you like to see targeted here uh, in a cell signals over the next three months. We actually diagrammed back in uh, December that we wanted to split up the bushels that, want, that a grower wanted to have sold before U.S. summer weather. In other words, we, we want to sell part of, during South American weather risk and the balance during U.S. summer weather risk. And, and we believe that those bushels needed to be sold in December and January. And so here we, we've already passed the optimum time. We had an excellent sell signal and opportunities both in December and in January. And so we pretty well got people comfortable on selling old crop. And we've sold up to half of the new crop that they want to get sold um, uh, before harvest time. So we're really thinking that you, that you have to have a pretty good uh, uh, increment uh, sold mm -hmm. on this next rally in, in soybeans. All right. In the cattle market, we had, uh, it seemed like a lot of bearish news come out against this market with the cattle inventory report, cattle on feed report, cold storage in the last week. We only dropped $2. John, is that a bullish sign in live cattle? <laughs> we don't go down on bearish news. Yeah. That is a positive sign. Yes, okay. it is. The, the, the thing that the bears are telling us that to be careful about is that we've, we've been putting big numbers on, on feed. The placement numbers for the last three months have all been big numbers, and they've been heavier weight cattle. And so, so we've got some numbers of some cattle, fed cattle to go through, but we're very current. Uh, in the in the feedlots, and if you look at the numbers that are over 90 days or over 120 days on feed, uh, they really aren't that big when you put them on a graph and compare them to some past years. So, so we've got some numbers to go through here for the next three, four months, and we need to stay current. Uh, but at the moment, the market uh, is got strong demand, and we're holding these prices really better than what people anticipated, as you said, particularly following what were surprisingly negative reports, particularly on the, on the inventory reports. Yes, yes, a lot of cattle out there in the countryside. And, you know, you'd expect to see that first hit the feeder cattle market. And we did see, you know, a little bit of a step back this week, $4 on feeders. Is that going to intensify here in the short term as we get into springtime? I think it's going to be a combination of, you know, what the fat cattle market does and what the corn market does. And, and uh, uh, but if the fat cattle market can hold itself together, if we can market through these cattle in a, in a, uh, 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 in an aggressive way, so we don't let anything get backlog. Then, then these feed cattle prices, these these cattle going on feed right now, could do well for you. Okay, 
and for the, the period you're worried about with those marketings, the next 60 days we're going to see a challenge chewing through the beef that's in the lots or 90 days? What's your timeline? Say, I would say in the next 90 days we're going okay. to have to eat our way through some, uh, through some numbers out here. Uh, but again, demand has been very strong. Right. Go out and grab a ribeye. Lean hogs. <laughs> lean hog market. We're, we're all over the board. Big moves in the lean hog market. We're up a little bit this week, cresting $70. How aggressive do you get on sales up in here? Well, it makes some sense to take some of the margins home uh, and uh, not leave it all lying on the table. But, but from a fundamental standpoint, looking at the market, you can't get yourself too uh, worried at the moment about the prices falling apart. Demand is solid. Uh, and uh, foreign demand, domestic demand, uh, bacon demand is crazy. The yes. the, uh, the belly prices are uh, are through the roof, so to speak. A 50-year low in belly supplies, I believe I read this past week. Yeah, and that uh, and so uh, we, we just, and it's, we're really talking about a very strong level of demand out there. All right, and even with additional production coming online, you're not worried about a 1998 repeat of overproducing for slaughter capacity. Well, the slaughter capacity is going up, and we've got okay. two more plants coming on stream, and so that's going to put a demand in there for the live animal in order to, to supply the packing plant. All so right. uh, uh, we just need to keep the consumer demand and the foreign demand solid. All right. U.S. dollar, John Roach, getting stronger? Yeah, but you know what? It looks to me like maybe it's going to back off here a little bit. So, you know, the market rolled over. Uh, and it rolled over in the face of, at a time when it really ought to be going higher. So, no, we're actually gearing ourselves for a little bit weaker dollar at this point. All right. Well, John Roach, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this week. Thank you, Mike. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. But John and I will keep the market conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, which you can find on our website. While you're there, check out the Market to Market Classroom, where you don't have to be in school to learn more about the science, technology, and business of farming. And join us again next week when we'll take a look at how a devastating tornado pulled a community together. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.